Go, eat your food with gladness, and drink your wine with a joyful heart, for it is now that God favors what you do. Always be clothed in white, and always anoint your head with oil. Enjoy life with your wife, whom you love, all the days of this meaningless life that God has given you under the sun, all your meaningless days. For this is your lot in life, and in your toilsome labor under the sun. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might, for in the grave, where you are going, there is neither working, nor planning, nor knowledge, nor wisdom. Well, that sounds depressing, doesn't it? I've had, uh, over the past uh, several months, maybe a year, three things that have, that have uh, come together to cause me to consider, think about my impending demise, and, and I'm not announcing that I have a terminal illness, we're all going to die, okay? Uh, and these are the three things. One was, uh, I attended a funeral where a poem called The Dash was read, and I'm going to read that for you in a little bit. It's a poem by Linda Ellis. The second thing was, uh, and I've told you about this before, we were out in Illinois visiting Mary Beth, or my daughter Mary Beth, and her husband Justin uh, in September. And we attended church with them, and there was a countdown clock in the back for the preacher. It counted down 20 minutes, and then when he went over time, past the 20 minutes he was allotted to preach, it started counting up in red to tell him how far he'd gone over time. It caused me to think about a lot of things, and one of them is how much time I probably have left with you if I live long enough to retire. And that countdown's out on the bulletin board. After today, probably about 271 Sundays. And then the third thing was uh, several Monday nights ago, we had a fellow by the name of Bob Krupp do the sermon. And uh, he actually spoke from Ecclesiastes and talked about some of the uh, challenges he's had in his life. And so those three things uh, came together, and I just... Thinking about stuff like that, and that's that was kind of the what brought me to thinking about what I want to talk to you about today. Now, as was read in John 10:10, 10, Jesus summed up his mission on earth by saying, "I'm come that they might have life, and might have it more abundantly." Now, in Lent, we went through the "I am" statements of Jesus, and he actually said that in between, "I am the gate, and I'm the good shepherd." I'm come that they might have life have it more abundantly, or as, that's the King James Version, as Jonathan read, it says, have it to the full. Do you know anybody that hates getting up in the morning? I know people that have hated get up in the morning. They didn't like their own life. They didn't care if they lived or died. And then something miraculous happened to them. They had an encounter with Jesus. And I've had, seen people go from hating their own life having a relationship with Christ, who now say, I love life. I know you're supposed to look forward to going to heaven, but I'm having fun here. Maybe I ought to stop and ask the question, is it okay we allowed to have fun here in this life? Is that all right? I know people who don't think so. I know people who believe you measure the holiness of someone by the degree of the frown on their face. And the holier you are, the more you're like this. I don't subscribe to that. I think it's perfectly fine to live this life and to have fun and enjoy each other. But you know, when, when you go to a, a cemetery, you'll see, for example, Donald L. Moore, born January 18, 1956, then a little dash, and then whatever the date of my death will be. And with that in mind, Linda Ellis wrote a poem called The Dash that I'd like to read. And this is one of the things, when I heard this last year, that, that got me thinking towards ending up with this sermon today. I read of a man who stood to speak at the funeral of a friend. He referred to the dates on the tombstone from the beginning to the end. He noted that first came the date of birth and spoke the dates with tears. But he said what mattered most of all was the dash between those years. For that dash represents all the time that she spent alive on earth. And now only those who loved her know what that little line was worth. For it matters not how much we own, the cars, the house, the cash, 
What matters is how we live and love and how we spend our dash. So think about this long and hard. Are there things you'd like to change? For you never know how much time is left that can still be rearranged. If we could just slow down enough to consider what's true and real and always try to understand the way other people feel and be less quick to anger and show appreciation more and love the people in our lives like we've never loved before. If we treat each other with respect and more often wear a smile, remembering that this special dash might only last a little while. So when your eulogy is being read, when your life's actions to rehash, would you be proud of the things they say about how you spent your dash? Again, that poem is The Dash by Linda Ellis. So again, that kind of was one of the impetus that brought me to this sermon today to think about what am I doing with my dash? What am I doing with my life? How am I feeling? And it caused me as a preacher, of course, to want to ask you the question, same question. What are you doing with yours? That thing that will someday mark your gravestone from your birth date to your death date. Well, again, from Ecclesiastes 9, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. In the grave where you're going, there's neither working or planning your knowledge nor wisdom. Whatever, the message puts it this way, whatever turns up, grab it and do it. Because stuff turns up, right? There's all, I don't care how good of a planner you are. Unpredictable things come up in your life. No matter how you plan your day, something unexpected always comes up. Well, what this is saying is when it does, grab it and do it. But there, there might actually be a deeper theological meaning. Take hold of ordinary responsibilities. Make sure they get done. You know, how many of us have said, well, not you skinny people, but tomorrow I'm going to start the diet. Tomorrow I'm going to look for a new job. Tomorrow I'm going to buy a new computer. Tomorrow I'll finish the turn paper or paint the living room or read a book or go back to college or any of a thousand things. Meanwhile, there's all kinds of stuff that's got to be done. And some of it's tedious. It gets left undone while we dream about what we're going to do someday. Charles Spurgeon wrote this. It's better to do what you need to do than to waste four hours dreaming about what you'd like to do. When Solomon says, whatever your hand finds to do, do it, he doesn't finish it with, well, and if you don't find it, then take the day off and watch TV. There's always something to be done, right? Let me just suggest a few things. Somebody's got to clear the table. Somebody's got to take out the garbage. Somebody's got to walk the dog and be sure to take the pooper scooper with you. I have a neighbor who does not take the scooper with him. Somebody's got to pay the bill. Somebody's got to get to the office early and check the invoices. Somebody has to get the oil changed in the car. Somebody has to greet the customers. Somebody has to be on call this weekend. Somebody has to stay late and lock up. Somebody's got to teach that Sunday school class. Somebody has to file the paper. Somebody has to, to process the loan application. Somebody has to drive the carpool on Thursday. We can't say, I don't feel like doing it. Your feelings don't matter. We all have stuff we got to do. Some of it's enjoyable and some of it isn't. We have chores, jobs, responsibilities, assignments in life. You don't get a free ride. You can't stay in bed forever. No matter how <coughs> inviting that sounds. And some days it sounds inviting. And he also says to do it with all your might or 100% commitment. Martin Luther King Jr. put it like this. Whatever your life's work is, do it well. Each person should do their job so that no one could do it better. If it falls to your lot to be a street sweeper, sweep the streets like Michelangelo painted pictures, like Shakespeare wrote poetry, like Beethoven composed music. Sweep the streets so well that all the hosts of heaven and earth will have to pause and say, here lived a great street sweeper who swept his job well. Now, there's also, again, a theology lesson here. If you believe in the sovereignty of God, then you believe it's true that you are where you are because God wants you there. Because if he didn't want you there, you'd be somewhere else. You are where you are right now because it's by God's design 
that he wants you where you are doing what you're doing. If you believe that, you can get up and go to work every day, no matter how bad the situation, and say, Lord, I'm doing this for your glory. In the grave where you're going, there's neither working, nor planning, nor knowledge, nor wisdom. This just sounds like such a downer. Who wants to talk about death? But it's coming for all of us, right? We all have an appointment that you will keep. When Mary and I keep our appointment, we shall be buried next to the snowman family at the White Chapel Cemetery. And I've made, we, when we bought the graves, we made them easy to find so our children can come every day and cry. You go in the main gate, drive down the road, and when you get to the big flagpole, all you gotta do is turn around, Start down the other way, and you just go a little bit, and we'll be right there, close to the road. We're easy to find. We have planned for this. We know where we'll be. I was very impressed when Nancy Reagan planned her own funeral. Did you know that? She planned every single part of who she wanted there, what she wanted them to do, everything, right down. She, she dealt with the inevitable. Now, like I said, a lot of people don't like to talk about it. They don't like to think about it. Plain and simple truth is it comes for all of us, and nobody's guaranteed tomorrow. But a lot of times we live as if we don't believe it. It's not going to happen to me. Starting then, Let's back up a little to the verses that uh, lead up to that verse. He says, go and eat your food with gladness. Drink your wine with a joyful heart. God has already approved what you do. Always be clothed in white. Always anoint your head with oil. Enjoy life with your wife whom you love. All the days of this meaningless life that God has given you under the sun. All your meaningless days. This is your lot in life and in your toilsome labor under the sun. Let me give you a paraphrase of that. Enjoy a good meal. Appreciate every moment as a gift from God. Wear clothes that speak of joy, not sorrow. Brush your hair if you got it. Wash your face. Put on your makeup. Iron your shirt. Look sharp. Put a smile on your face. Don't be a grumpy old man or old woman or a grumpy young one either. Look for God's hand at work in your life. If you're married, enjoy your spouse. Savor every little moment you spend together. Savor your time with your friends. And realize that God is at work in the details of your life. Where you were born, to those parents, growing up in that town, meeting those friends, following your career path. They're all part of God's plan. Some people see this clearly and some it makes no sense. If I were to summarize my so far 60 years shortly, I would have to at least include this. If I'm ungrateful or unhappy, I'm wasting the time God has given me. And I'm guilty of questioning his wisdom and doubting his goodness. Now, over the past 23 years, some of you have uh, heard me talk enough about my growing up years and my past and my family that you know this, but some of you don't. I grew up in a small town in western Pennsylvania that's smaller now than it was when I grew up thanks to uh, steel mills closing and, and a lot of people moving away. There was nothing outstanding about my family or my, my growing up years. I'm not remarkably smart or athletic or gifted in anything except maybe I can do math really fast in my head. I could focus on this part of me. I'm too short, I'm too fat, I'm too bald, and I got too many things that hurt. Or, I could look back and see how God nudged me and steered me. From starting out at Geneva College and then transferring to Roberts Wesleyan, where I met my wife, which resulted in our kids. And as things went on from Meadville to Dubois to Lockport to here, 
where my sons met their spouses because we moved here and Mary Beth went off to Greenville College from here and met her spouse to the four grandchildren that we have. I could choose to see, look at, like I said, everything that's wrong with me, or I could choose to look for God. When uh, Ashton and Payson are at our house or when we're in the car, they like to play a little game called I Spy With My Little Eye. You ever play this? It'll go like this. I spy with my little eye something blue. And then you have to all guess. You know, you got to look for all the blue. Well, you know what? You know what's amazing? Is how many blue things you find when you're looking for blue things. And in the next person's turn, maybe they pick red or green or yellow. It doesn't matter. So how many things you find of that color when that's what you're looking for. Well, I'm going to suggest to you that you play I spy with my little eye, God. Look for his blessings in your life and his involvement in your life. I want the dash, when my copper plate, they don't allow headstones at Whitechapel. When my copper plate's put down at the Whitechapel Cemetery and people see the dash, I want them to know it was filled with serving the Lord and singing and loving and having a good time with my family. When I'm laid to rest beside the snowman family. But here's another thing that I want to tell you. I don't want to die until I'm dead. Have you known people that have died before they're dead? Yeah. It's like, meh, you know. I want to I live until the very last moment. I want to do everything I can to persuade other people to follow Jesus. And while I'm doing that, I want to enjoy the life God has given me. I believe that pleases him. Let's pray. Lord, I believe that we see what we look for. We can see the problems, see the bad, see things that can make us depressed, or we can see you if that's what we look for. So help us to fill the dash in our life with things that please you and to see how you have been involved and have helped us and therefore to live our lives as a sacrifice to you. In Jesus' name, amen.